Take a look at me. Is it obvious that I'm a qualified mechanical engineer? Don't worry, it's not obvious and I'm used to it. I've never fit any of the stereotypes. I'm not wearing greasy overalls, a hard hat or a fluorescent jacket, and I'm certainly not a man. So how could I be an engineer? The thing is, I was always expected to study engineering. As the eldest of three daughters with a Sri Lankan dad who's also an engineer, I was always going to end up following in his footsteps. It was either that or a career in medicine. Education is considered to be a passport to freedom, especially for immigrants. It earns us respect, it gives us choices and social status. And when you come from humble beginnings, but say you're a PhD from a great university, people are impressed. My parents and ancestors came from developing countries, so a Western education was a sure way to build a decent life for themselves. But regardless of where any of us come from and what any of us have, we all want the same basic things in life. We all want safety, stability and security. An education in STEM was a sure way for me to get those basic things. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering and maths. You know, those subjects that girls can't do or is it won't do. Girls don't fit the STEM stereotypes. We're supposed to be nurturing carers and meant to always look pretty and get along with everybody. Boys, on the other hand, are expected to be competitive, assertive and dominant. What must these stereotypes do for people long term? For those boys who aren't confident and outspoken, they're told that they're weak. Weak. That's a label that's bound to shatter anybody's confidence. And similarly, if girls are said to be outspoken and confident, well, they're labelled as intimidating or even arrogant. And those labels can certainly crush any person's strength. 1.6 million elementary, high school and university students were surveyed in Australia. And ironically, girls actually do better than boys across all subjects at school. It's self-confidence that lets students down. 11,500 females between the ages of 11 and 30 in Europe were surveyed by Microsoft and the results revealed that they enjoy STEM between the ages of 11 and 15 and 60% of them would pursue STEM careers if there were equal opportunities for them. A recent study by the Education Policy Institute and the Prince's Trust conducted over two years and based on data from the Millennium Cohort study found the proportion of girls that felt unhappy about their appearance rose sharply between the ages of 11 and 14. Now, if you combine all of this data, it seems that around early teens, girls experience an inner conflict between how they look and what they study at school, and that is influencing their career choices. And it all originates from stereotypes. To me, these statistics also suggest that girls who are more than capable in STEM don't want to spend their careers in discouraging, unsupportive environments. And it makes sense, right? I mean, life is already tough enough. Stereotypes just invite judgment and criticism and ultimately disconnection. We need to embrace those that want to be pioneers and trailblazers, people who want to use their talents and skills to really make a difference. I didn't fit into any of those stereotypes. Up until the age of 15, I was really terrible at maths and I certainly wasn't pretty. I kept getting 50% in all my maths exams. I had no confidence, no self-esteem, but like I said, I had a whole load of pressure and expectation to become an engineer. I had to make my parents proud and I had to make their struggle to get to London to give their kids a British education worthwhile. So I put my mind to it. I worked really, really hard, literally sleeping three hours a night sometimes, solving one maths problem after the next, and my grades went from 50% to over 90%. All that hard work paid off because in 2004, I got my doctorate in engineering. It took me almost eight years to get those qualifications, but the hope of providing myself with my own safety, stability and security through a job of my own was now closer than ever before. I love that quote by Nelson Mandela. 
education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Using my school education, I could help change the statistics of the number of female engineers of colour in the UK. In 2017, 11% of all engineers were female. That's an improvement to the statistics that were around when I graduated back in the early 2000s. The number of people of colour in engineering was so insignificant back then that, that no data even existed for us. Today in the UK, 9% of all engineers are from ethnic minorities, according to a report by Engineering UK in 2018. On a positive note, studying made me realise that I could do anything I put my heart and mind to. We all can. My school education really developed my brain. It taught me to think logically, approach things methodically and see the world rationally. But I must say I also picked up some really bad habits which have taken some time to shake off because at school I also became competitive egotistical and absolutely terrified of failure. I was constantly comparing myself to others, never truly believing that I was smart enough or good enough or talented enough. I was at school to build my personal statement and CV so I could get into the best schools and get the best jobs and live the best life in the best neighborhoods. And I kept falling short of every one of those ambitions. Which is fine, you know, you aim for the stars and you end up reaching the moon. But while I was on my moon, I gazed out at those stars, feeling like a real failure. I wasn't building confidence with every accomplishment. I was destroying all sense of who I truly was at my core. I'd become a human doing rather than a human being obsessed with driving my life forward at breakneck speed and it was everybody else's opinion of me at the steering wheel. I was so focused on pushing this, my IQ, to its limits and I was pushing this, my heart and emotional intelligence to one side just so that my feelings wouldn't interfere with my well thought out plans. Emotional intelligence, or EQ, was first brought to a mainstream audience through a book written by psychologist Daniel Goleman in 1995. He talked about EQ as having the ability to recognise and manage emotions. Goleman told Harvard Business Review that emotional intelligence was crucial for leadership, for steering companies in the right directions. But let's be real, emotions are really difficult to talk about, let alone manage. For a start, they can't be graded or even quantified, so schools aren't teaching us about them. Emotions are messy, inconvenient, and make us feel really vulnerable. And girls are usually judged to be way more emo emotional than boys, even though statistically, men and women have equal capacities for EQ. It's true that men and women are hardwired differently, meaning that we have different neuroanatomies or brain structures, which means that we think and behave differently at a basic level. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from one another. Women have a natural tendency to be more empathetic, better at interpersonal relationships, and are more socially responsible, which are all indicators of emotional intelligence whilst men score higher in areas of assertiveness, stress tolerance, and self-regard, which are also emotionally intelligent traits. But surely women can be more assertive and men can be more empathetic. I mean, why not? Stereotypes, that's why not. Leaders such as Gandhi, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela all had empathy and in my opinion, were all true examples of men. Female leaders today, such as German Chancellor Angela Merkel, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, or Vice President Kamala Harris, are all really assertive, confident, and composed, especially in stressful situations. None of these emotionally intelligent traits are reserved for either gender, in the same way that STEM subjects don't need to be just for boys. All these skills from IQ to EQ can be learned if that's what you want to learn for yourself. So where do we go to get an education on emotions? Einstein said that education is what remains after one has forgotten what they've learned at school. And you know what? I couldn't agree more. 
I had to get a wholesome Einstein education through reverse engineering. Reverse engineering myself. Reverse engineering is a process where engineers take a device apart, let's say an aeroplane, and they study every single component of that aeroplane in massive detail to either make an exact copy of that plane or further improve components to make a better plane, maybe one that flies faster or higher on less fuel. For me, about eight years ago, I found myself with a great college education and fantastic career prospects, but absolutely no meaning or purpose in life. Earning loads of money and accumulating status symbols like clothes and cars and holidays just didn't feel fulfilling enough. Through reverse engineering myself, I took myself apart and examined every aspect of my life in great detail from my job, to the people in my life, to the dynamics between me and my family. I even analyzed my values, ambitions, and dreams. It was a proper self introspection and at many moments it was confusing and uncomfortable and messy. But my IQ and my EQ had become so detached from one another that I had to make that journey back from my head to my heart. Sometimes life can get so busy for us that we don't ever get to do this kind of self-analysis. The day-to-day -day rigmarole of our lives can turn us into machines where we just eat, sleep and work. Eat, sleep and work. We can get so distracted by our to-do list that we don't have time to feel our emotions or be fully present for our lives. A caterpillar does the exact same thing. It just munches its way through as many leaves as it can until one day it stops eating. It hangs itself upside down and spins itself into a cocoon. After some time in this cocoon, it grows parts of itself that it never had before, like wings. And when the time is right, it's then ready to break free, so it wriggles and tussles its way out of that cocoon. That struggle to escape is essential for building strength in its brand new wings, and eventually it flies away from its former self as an iridescent butterfly. It's one of nature's greatest transformations and something similar to the process I went through as I reverse engineered myself. Everything I thought I wanted, I had, and everything my parents hoped for me, I'd already achieved. So I turned my life upside down and spent several years in a cocoon. Through meditations and long road trips through America, where I was living at the time, and plucking up the courage to go on dates by myself, I was reawakening parts of me that I had shut down in order to excel academically. I explored my ability to paint, to create, to perform, and I spent a lot of time journaling my thoughts. I did acting courses, made wall collages out of old magazines, and created a podcast where I listened to other people's stories and experiences. I did things that couldn't be marked, graded, or stereotyped, and all throughout I broadened my awareness of my outer and inner experiences. Companies are recognizing the positive global impact on life experiences, on business success. They're hiring more and more diverse and inclusive teams because people from all backgrounds, cultures, and traditions bring different perspectives to the table, and it's emotions that determine our experiences. What we think and feel can be the difference between a good experience and a bad one. It's all about our attitude. The breakup of a relationship, the jobs we didn't get and the friends that let us down all seem like personal catastrophes, really bad experiences that were just there at the time. But looking back, they were actually blessings because they nudged us in directions that we hadn't planned for ourselves. All experiences, good and bad, have shaped me who, into who I am today. And my school education was just a small part of that jigsaw puzzle. My attitudes towards my past, present and future are at the steering wheel of my life now, and it's life that's teaching me how to drive. Remember in maths class where the teacher didn't want to just see the answer, but actually all of the workings out? Reverse engineering allowed me to explore all of my workings out. We put far too much emphasis on getting that right answer, but the journey is way more important than the destination. 
that cheesy saying that never seems to get old. I wish emotional intelligence was taught in schools and I also wish that students had the time to get messy and fail. I've learned so much from my own mistakes. Rejection, disappointment and loss have all been my greatest teachers and are all part of the turbulence we go through to reach higher and higher heights. But let's be grateful for the education that we all get to have from the school of life. It's not essential that we have the most prestigious educations or perfect parents or privileged childhoods. What is essential is gaining self-awareness to learn from every experience we've had so that our lives are full of meaning and purpose. For me, reverse engineering myself gave me a greater sense of who I am, which means going forward, I have a better chance of choosing exactly who and how I want to be. Self-awareness and emotional intelligence is where we build self-esteem and where we gain the self-confidence and self-belief to flip off the stereotypes. Martin Luther King said, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that's the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. Yes, IQ is important, but so is EQ, and everybody is on their own individual journeys with that. Concentrate on your own transformation from caterpillar to butterfly, and you too can reach your very own cruising altitude. Thank you.